Hey Jody here with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com doing a little bit more stick welding today we're using 7018 rods and we're going to weld vertical uphill. We're going to do a plate test and some padding beads vertical uphill for practice if you're not ready to take this test yet. So that's an awful lot to cover in one video so we better get started. Alright well this is the test. Very common test and oftentimes given along with an overhead test. So vertical and overhead, very common to take together for shipyards and heavy equipment type operations and things like that. But we'll start off trying to shoot for a 90 degree rod angle. No push, no drag, shoot for a 90 degree rod angle. And the reason I suggest that is, for me, if you're like me, when you shoot for a 90 degree, you're going to wind up with a little bit of push angle anyway. So that works out good for me. Hope it does for you too. I'm going to be starting off this first pass here at about 120 amps. So let's just fire up on that thing and take a look and talk about it. You can see already I got a little push angle going, even though I really wasn't, wasn't aiming for that. What you're trying to do on the root pass is you want to consume the corners of the bevels without leaving any undercut or anything like that, and you also want to burn into the backing strap. So it takes a little bit of rod movement usually in order to do that. Now this root pass sometimes is run in two passes using a smaller rod. Uh, some people prefer to do that, nothing wrong with it. It's not always permitted though. Now I should be coming up on those walls a little bit further than I am and I'll, sh I'll show you, I'll go ahead and show you all the passes on this first test plate all the way out and, 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 sh and talk about why that was a little bit of a problem. So I'm not coming uh, out quite wide enough in order to put a heavy root pass in there to lessen the whole total number of passes it takes to finish this thing. We'll take a look at it later. All right. So my tie-in is, uh, that's one rod, took me that far. Kind of light up in front and long arc it just for a little bit and then get right back in that crater. And you want to try to do that without wasting a lot of time. The metals, when the metal is good and hot, generally you have less likelihood of porosity or cold lap or anything like that on a tie-in. Oftentimes I'll keep that second rod in my hand and I'll just chuck it right back up and as soon as I get out I'll just pretty much get right back in there. Alright well let's talk briefly about stringer beads versus weaving. More and more welding tests are requiring stringer beads and prohibiting weaving. That's because of an issue with heat input. Weaving puts more heat in. Oftentimes you'll see a, you'll see somebody weaving on something like a 3 8 plate and you'll see a red hot area just moving up the plate like the size of a half dollar. That's good for welding as far as burning out slag and restarts and all that stuff. Bad because it causes grain growth. Grain growth uh, is kind of a degrading of the materials. Big grains can cause a loss of toughness and that might cause a part, a bridge, a building, a high pressure steam line to fail 10, 15 years down the, the way when, when it's designed to last a lot longer than that as long as the grain growth didn't happen. So that's the reason they require it. And it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's it in a nutshell. So you've got to be ready to run stringers. Now, if I have my preference, I would at least run like one hot weave pass over the root, just because it's kind of tough to stack two in there. That's where you're most likely to trap yourself and trap slag and, and not penetrate into that crease if you don't stack your beads, your stringers properly. So if I had my druthers, I would weave at least one pass after that root pass and then do stringers. You got to follow the, you have to follow the WPS, the welding procedure specification that they give you when you're taking a welding test. So let's get back to the video. All right, this is just an, this is just an example of what I would prefer to do. I'm actually using a different machine here. It's a Miller Thunderbolt and you can hear it buzzing in the background. But I'm using a, you know, one pass, one weave pass over top of the root pass, and it's going in there nice and hot, and that's what I would prefer to do, and then stringer the rest of it out. But again, not always allowed. So I'm, I'm doing stringers for this video. This is the first pass over top of the root pass, and it looks something like this. I'm, I'm starting out on the right hand side. Really doesn't matter if you go left to right, right to left. The main thing is to plan ahead. So I've got this thing far enough to the right so that I'm leaving myself enough room to put that second pass in without having it be too tight of a valley. Oftentimes, again, grinding is not allowed on welding tests, or if it's allowed, it's, it's uh, permitted very, under very limited circumstances. So see, I've got a nice, nice little area in there. It's not too tight. Rod fits in there nice and good. So the second pass over top of the root pass should, should go in there okay. Let's do that. Even though I left myself plenty of room, 
and I'm running pretty hot here, uh, it just it just always wonder if I'm really getting in there like I should on these stringers, and that's what I really don't don't like too much about them. But that is the that is the trick is you got to plan one beat ahead so as not to place that second to the last beat. In this case, it was the second beat is the last beat, but you got to plan one beat ahead so as to leave yourself enough room to burn in. Now, that's where I am now, and actually it's a little low. I know I'm going to have to really go slow in order to cap that thing and have any height to the cap at all, so I'm going to put two little quick passes, not spending much time at all, and fill it up a little bit more before I put the cover pass on there. And and I I, would, I didn't really want to do that. I'm showing you anyway. I kind of I just didn't plan and I didn't run a heavy enough root pass. So now it's ready for a cover pass. It's just very slightly below flush in places and and pretty much flush in others. So that was the first pass. This is the second pass. And the third pass, you really want to keep an eye on you really want to keep an eye on the left hand side or whatever the side is that's that's tying into the base plate so that you don't leave any undercut. Alright, well that's my first try. I'm going to try to get better as I go here. We'll run another one here and I will, I will run a little slower and a little wider on the root pass and carry a heavier, heavier root pass. And see, I'm moving along fairly slow here. Same amperage and everything. And I'm coming out just a little bit further onto those bevels. And that's going to that's going to deposit more metal, and it's going to allow me to only put two passes before I put that before I put the cover pass on there. And that's what I that's what I prefer to do. Nothing wrong with usually usually the number of passes is not specified. That's kind of like hey, it just takes what it takes, and uh, sometimes you're even you're even uh, allowed or permitted within the procedure to use a 332nd rod if you want to. But I prefer one eighth just because of a lot less tie-ins. Okay, so now we're getting ready to put that second one on there, and I forgot to turn the camera on, so it looks the same as it did on the first plate. But now we'll put the cover pass on there. Now I want to keep a really good eye on the right hand side of that bead and travel slowly enough to not leave any undercut. And that undercut right there is probably because I didn't clean the plates. It's got mill scale on it. You want to clean that mill scale off about a half inch away from where the weld's going to be and it kind of helps. Sometimes that mill scale dissolves in the weld and pops out, out gases and leaves a little, just a little small amount of undercut. Now the tolerance for undercut on a, on a test plate like this is usually somewhere around a 32nd of an inch, but you don't want any. And if you need to for the last bead, if you're having trouble with undercut, because now all you're doing is welding a bead on plate pretty much with that last bead. Turn it down a little bit. I turned it down to 110 amps here just to make sure, try to make sure I didn't have undercut and uh, boom. That one's done now. Let's take a look at that after a little wire brushing a little better than the first one probably hopefully the third one would go even better so while we got this plate here and I had a back and strap welded on it with some scrap uh, let's go ahead and run a lap joint on that back and strap and then we'll also do some padding beads vertical which is really good practice if you're not ready to do a plate test yet or anything if you can't run a good bead vertical uphill it makes a lot of sense just to do padding one thing I want you to notice about this lap the first pass in that lap joint I'm really not doing anything different than I was the first pass in the in the V groove joint. So you know if you can weld vertical up lap joints and vertical up on uh, just padding beads, then you can you can do a plate test. Same technique, very little move, movement, maybe just a little bit of side to side, or a little slight upside down U. Lots of different methods work. Find something that works for you, and uh, practice and perfect it. Doing just a little three-pass fillet weld here, and actually I'm not holding long enough on that left side, and you'll see what happens when I chip the slag off this thing. A little bit choppy there. See that? Should have come over a little bit further and kind of consumed and totally rolled that edge over. It would have looked better. All right, I got some scrap plates here. Just going to do some vertical beads, stacking them on top of one another. Really good practice. No point, no point in burning up test plates if you can't do this yet. So it makes sense to get some scrap 
and just stack a whole bunch of beads. Practice the stacking, practice running good beads, practice stacking halfway over top of each other, and it, it really does kind of ingrain those motor skills in you to where it's kind of second nature. A little side view here so you can see, again, that 90 degree rod angle that I'm attempting to, to achieve. A lot of times I'll prop, sometimes I'll use one hand and just kind of steady myself up with the other hand on the piece. Whatever works for you. It, it doesn't hurt to practice using one hand too because there are, there are going to be those times when you don't have a choice. And you can notice I've got a slight push angle going even though I'm shooting for 90 degrees. Now I'm using a very little electrode manipulation here. Just, just trying to just very slight side to side to help the bead to flatten out. Also uh, I'm messing around with several different machines here. You might notice a different stinger come into the picture here. And so I'm playing around. Some of them are inverters. Some of them have uh, arc control also called the dig function. And padding beads like this is a great opportunity to mess around with things like the dig dig control or arc control and learn what they do before you get on to actual test joints and things like that. Arc length is a big big thing on this type of exercise. Anything out of position, vertical and overhead, and you can see I'm holding a long arc here. Things are not going well at all. Puddle is drooping, sagging, and there, boom, there it goes, it falls out. Big ball of fire down my boot if I'm not careful. Some of the best advice I can give you for welding a vertical uphill joint like this is use enough amps that you can hold a tight arc without sticking the rod, then hold a tight arc. Another thing is about 120 to 135 amps is about where you want to be. Shoot for that dead nuts 90 degree rod angle. You'll probably have a little push angle anyway. Limit your electrode manipulation because some tests are very strict on that. And plan ahead one bead. Make sure to leave room for that next bead so you don't trap yourself in a corner. Alright, well that is all I got for you today. Thanks for watching. See you next week.